Okay, I thought just precedent to our class on book nine, and we'll focus on book nine, um, obviously, with uh, the, the story from Genesis. Um, I thought we could, we would look at um, the invocation. We said there are four invocations, book one, book three, book seven, and book nine. I think that's correct. Book one, book three, book seven, and book nine. So I thought we'd look at a couple of invoc invocations. The one in book seven is probably the, the, the strangest. Um, and the one in book nine, well, we'll take a look at that also, hopefully. Um, it is odd that Milton, why does Milton do this? Why four invocations? Be satisfied with one. It would be interesting to think about what he achieves, what he accomplishes in each one of the four. I'm sure it's something different. Um, so that would be something, of course, to think about. Um, let's look at this one. And we'll look at one in book nine. Descend from heaven, Urania. Who's Urania? The Roman muse of astronomy. Okay, so it's not that it's not the muse of poetry. Who's the muse of poetry? I forget. Descend from heaven, Urania, by that name, if rightly thou art called, whose voice divine following above the Olympian hill I soar, above, above the flight of Pegasian wing. Pegasus is a mythical winged horse. Who created uh, offspring of Poseidon and Medusa, who created the muse's sacred fountain. Associated with poetic inspiration. Okay. Descend from heavenly heaven, Urania, by that name, if rightly thou art called. One of the reasons Milton might be interested so much in invocations is because he's continually thinking about the possibility of the poetry that he's writing. And we, we've been talking about the extent to which Paradise Lost is a book about reading, and insofar that it's a book about reading, um, we're not surprised to find that Milton spends so much time talking about um, inspiration, representation, and interpretation. And for him, inspiration is obviously important since he's claiming a certain kind of heavenly status for his poetry. Maybe the heavenly status of his poetry is simply that he is dealing with things that are invisible to mortal sight, perhaps not lawful to reveal. Descend from heaven, Urania, by that name, if rightly thou art called, whose voice divine following above the Olympian hill, I soar above the flight of Pegasian wing, if rightly thou art called, even even in the even in calling out to this muse, even in the invocation, there is a set, there is that idea that well maybe I'm not calling you by the right name. Maybe there is not a compa Maybe there is an incompatibility between what I'm calling you and what you are. Um, the meaning, not the name, I call. skirting around the, the problem. For thou, nor of the muses nine, nor on the top of old Olympus dwellest, but heavenly born before the hills appeared or fountain flowed, thou with eternal wisdom didst converse. So there was some kind of communication between this muse of the heavens well within daily intimacy. Thou with eternal wisdom didst converse. Wisdom, my sister. Sorry, one more time. Before the hills appeared or found in flow, thou with eternal wisdom didst converse. Wisdom, my sister, and with her didst play in presence of the Almighty Father. Pleased with thy celestial song, upled by thee into the heaven of heavens, I have presumed an earthly guest, that's me going up, and drawn imperial air, thy tempting, thy tempering, uh, That is, Urania has tempered either the narrator or the imperial air in order that he, immortal, might breathe the rarefied air of heaven. The muse is this mediator between the earth and heaven. With like safety guided down, return to me, my native element. Learn from this flying steed on rain, that's Pegasus, as once Bellerophon, though from a lower clime. Dismounted on the Elean field, I fall erroneous there to wander and forlorn. Lorn. Look up the, the references here at home to Bellerophon and the alien field. Um, the poet here, though, does imagine himself. Let's read again at the very end. Um, lest, least is less, lest from this flying steed on rain, dismounted on the alien field, I fall erroneous there to wander and forlorn. 
Being want, wandering, I told you, it's a very interesting word in the, in the text. This one doesn't come up that often. Um, but here, the poet himself is afraid of wandering and forlorn. Who else is forlorn? I'm pretty sure it's the devils in book one. Half yet remains unsung, beginning of book seven, right? Half, I'm halfway there. Yet remains unsung, but narrower bound within the visible diurnal sphere, standing on earth, not wrapped above the pole. More safe, I sing with mortal voice, unchanged to horse your mute. Though fallen on evil days, on evil days, though fallen in evil tongues, in darkness, and with dangers compassed round and solitude. Okay. Um, I, get, I missed the first part. What is a diurnal sphere? That's a daily sphere. The, vis oh, the visible a universe that resolves diurnally around the Earth. See, Milton obviously knew his Copernicus, right? He, he, needs, he gets the astronomy right. Half yet remains unsung, but now we're bond within the visible diurnal sphere, standing on Earth. Oh, not wrapped above the pole. I see it's narrower because we're going to Earth. More safe, I sing with mortal voice, unchanged to more horse or mute the fallen. I'm not, I'm not horse or mute. Um, Uh, whatever, uh, okay. To horse or mute, though fallen on evil days, on evil days, though fallen in evil tongues in darkness and with dangers compassed round in solitude. We continue to come back to, to Milton as our contemporary, right? I mean, not only maybe in an experience of a political reality, but not to the dire extent that Milton is feeling isolation and oppression, evil fallen on evil days, on evil days they'll fall in evil tongues in darkness and with dangers compassed round and solitude. So Milton's sense, he's our contemporary because of maybe this experience of existential solitude, but he's also giving voice to the particularity of his historical trauma, right? Evil days in darkness and dangers compassed round and solitude. You know, all the jokes when uh, COVID first started and people were saying, well, King, uh, you know, Shakespeare wrote King Lear during a, a, a play. Well, you know, we're trying to get through the semester, but um, it's interesting how Milton takes this traumatic event and turns it into Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost, that's another meaning of the poem. It's not just about, there are different kinds of paradise that could lost. Um, Yet not alone, while thou visitest my slumbers nightly or when morn purples the east, East, still govern thou my song, Urania, and fit audience find, though few. So he calls out to Urania and says, please find me an audience. It's okay, it's good that I talk to you, but I need to find a fit audience. Though even now, he admits, though few, how different, how far away we are from the world of Aria Pagitica, right? Where everybody's, where everybody after the, uh, the, the, the passages in, in, in um, numbers, Last week's partial. Um, there's Milton. Milton talks about Medad and Eldad. Is that what their names are? Those are the ones who are prophesizing in with everybody else. And once the, the somebody who's identified as young, according to the rabbis, it's either Joshua or Gershon, run to Moses and say everybody is prophesizing, um, as if it's a bad thing. And um, Moses corrects him, and Milton uses that in Ariopagitica. We're all prophets, and it's okay. But now Milton just wants a fit audience, though few. But drive far off the barbarous dissonance of Bacchus and his revelers, the race of that wild rout that tore the Thracian bard in road up where woods and rocks had ears to rapture, till the savage clamor drowned both harp and voice, nor could the muse defend her son. So fail not thou who thee implores, for thou art heavenly, she an empty dream. I think Milton just always raises the stakes, right? You think you're like, you think you're on the way to me understanding what he's talking about, and then he, he goes even further with it. So the first thing is, is he's, he's imploring, drive far off, here's an invocation to the muse, do this for me, drive far off the barbarous dissonance of Bacchus and his revelers, the race of that wild route that toured the Thracian bard in Rhodo. Milton comparing himself to this Thracian bard and there's this fear, especially since he's look, uh, living through dark times, that he too will be torn to pieces 
where woods and rocks had ears to rapture till the savage clamor drowned the heart and voice. Wow, so that's kind of like, that's kind of like the world we live in now, right? Till the savage clamor drowned both harp and voice. We no longer can hear the music because there's such a clamor. Nor could the muse defend her son. Bummer, right? And then he says, so fail not thou who thee implores for thou art heavenly, she an empty dream. I mean, it's interesting. So this muse, look at the muse, who's, who's this muse? Calliope. I'm very confused by this. I'm just letting you know this. So this is Calliope, who's not a real muse, but the muse Urania somehow is a real muse. And, he, and Urania will defend him where the muse couldn't because she is an empty dream. I, I don't get it here, but it does seem that um, what, I, what I remarked at before, the part that I, I, I thought I was uh, getting a hold of was in the beginning, um, we have this sense that Milton is not sure who he's addressing or if he's using the right, he's sure he's addressing whatever wisdom, whatever uranium is meant to represent, I suppose, wisdom. And I suppose that's also why poetry is an empty dream for thou art heavenly, she, Calliope, the muse of poetry, an empty dream. Much further, much further thought uh, to think about here, but it is interesting to see what, what does Milton accomplish here is to show his total isolation. Um, to show there, there are various kinds of, um, there are various anxieties that Milton expresses. And here it's the, and, and primarily it's about the success of his own representation. And here he imagines, he's, he's not only threatened because of the, the intrinsic difficulties in, in reading and representing, but because he's surrounded by evil days and, and this barbarous dissonance of the mob, um, poetry might be drowned out altogether. And he's, and, and he's fearing for his life maybe, but he's also fearing for his poetic life. Maybe I won't be able to speak. So cool, right? Let's read, let's do the book nine one. No, almost nobody re reads that one. And like, unless you're really doing a hardcore Milton like we are. Let's see. Um, that's a little one longer, but let's go for it. No more of, this is book nine. No more of talk where God or angel guest with man is with, as, as with his friend familiar used to sit indulgent and with him partake rural repast, permitting him the wild venial discourse on blame. I guess it's casual venial every day. Hmm. Erroneous without being blamed for or sinful. Hmm. Muse is being nasty here. No more of talk where good or angel guest with man as with his friend familiar used to sit indulgent and with him partake rural repast, permitting him the wild venial discourse. Venial discourse, which I guess is bad, unblamed. Um, we're done with that part. We're done with you hanging around with Raphael, having, you know, the cold buffet. I now must change these notes to tragic, foul, distrust and breach disloyal on the part of man revolt and disobedience. This is not God, this is Milton the poet. On the part of heaven now alienated distance and distaste, anger and just rebuke and judgment given that brought into this world a world of woe, sin and her shadow, death and misery, death's harbinger. Um, I, I said Milton, but it's the epic narrator who is also a persona. Sad. To, I don't know how much do you want to make of that. That how how important is it to say when reading Paradise Laws that the voice of the narrator is a constructed one? Right, nineteenth century poems, which I haven't read for twenty years, they make a big virtue of this. Like you know, poems by Tennyson, whose names I don't remember, um, where it's clearly a persona who's speaking. Um, where the narrator is, is clearly a persona. So I'm wondering, we've been familiar with this from Wyatt, right? In Thomas Wyatt's work, Wyatt very carefully constructs a certain kind of male persona. Why does he do that? He does that in order to write about that persona, meaning he's not simply writing a poem um, about uh, a really pathetic guy um, who never succeeds. He's writing a, he's writing 
about that perspective. I mean, he's not just describing it, he's representing it. And because he's representing that perspective, he is able to comment on the consciousness that speaks in that way. I'm not sure, is that the same thing we're doing with Paradise Lost here in the Epic Narrator? Sad task, yet argument not less, but more heroic than the wrath of stern Achilles on his foe pursued thrice fugitive about Troy Wall. So on the one hand, it's sad, but how is it still more, how is it more heroic than the wrath of stern Achilles? Or rage of Turnus for Lavinia? That's, that's the Aeneid. Achilles is, of course, the, the Iliad. How can Milton's poem be more heroic than than that of the classics. I just love Milton as an example of classicism because you, you see the way in which Milton is energized by his past and he also takes it and transforms it. I think Milton may, may have to be a kind of model for us in thinking about reading other traditions. Um, I mean, we have two roles. One role we have is let's try to understand the poem as best as we can as Milton would want his ideal reader to understand it. And the other then is, is, well, Milton's model of reading is going back to the past and making it his own. And very clearly transforming the past in, in that process. I think for us as humanists, reading books and, and reading them more seriously now because of COVID, that's, that's our possibility that is going back to texts like this, which are foreign to us. We're not 17th century Puritans. Most of us are not even Christians. Um, we're Jews and if Milton you know, met us in a bar, you know, the joke about Milton meets a couple of Jews in the bar. He, Milton is with some Puritan friends and he meets a couple of Jews in the bar and his Puritan friends kill them, right? So, and nonetheless, right? And nonetheless, we're able to read this work and have our identity, keep our identities intact. Not even, that. not, not only that, not only are we able to keep our identities intact, more so we're able to strengthen our identity by going back into the past. That's what Milton is doing here. Um, or Neptune's ire or Juno's, hands on buzzers for that one. Neptune's ire, that's the Odyssey, right? Yeah, that so long perplexed the Greek and Cytherea's son. That's the Greek is Odysseus. Yay, right, we, I also took 191. If answerable style I can obtain, Appropriate, I guess, if answerable style I can obtain of my celestial patroness. Is that here? Urania, right. Oh, wait, so she's coming. Oh, should we dragged her from book seven? So she's back again. Um, oh, in book one also, she's there. So wisdom takes precedence over poetry, it seems like. I mean, obviously not, but the muse of wisdom, of, 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 of wisdom of my celestial patroness who, de who deigns her nightly visitation unimplored and dictates to me slumbering or inspires easy my unpremeditated verse. Hands on buzzers if you know anything about the rabbinic tradition. Um, it's pretty obvious that Milton is representing himself like a prophet who God speaks to at night. Um, and dictates to me slumbering or inspires easy. <laughs> Wait one, one second. Is it dictates or inspires? Or are those different? Dictates is God is, is talking, right? It, 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 and inspires is, well, God inspires. The muse, the muse is, is, is either dictating or inspiring. Inspiring emphasizes much more agency, right? Dictate is like, you know, I'm writing it down. Inspiring is, I'm inspired and I'm writing. Why both? Easy, my unpremeditated verse. That's kind of a lie, right? Milton's saying, I'm not even, I don't even think about it. Although we do know that when he was writing Paradise Lost, he dictated to his daughter, he was blind. If anybody has any spare time, any creative, creative writing people here, they can, that'd be a great kind of play to see that that, that, that scene represented and how a lot of, a lot of opportunities of inter, intertwining a conversation between Milton and his daughter with him um, reciting 
Paradise, maybe parts of Book Nine of Paradise Lost. A very, I know it's got a niche audience, but it does sound kind of cool. Um, since first this subject for heroic song pleased me long choosing, Milton had a notebook where he kept various ideas, I think over 40 ideas for the effort epic poem. Um, sort of King Arthur, various biblical stories. He chose this. Since first this subject for heroic song pleased me, long choosing and beginning late, not sedulous, what does that mean? Not sedulous, eager by nature to indict wars, hitherto the only argument heroic deemed, chief mastery to dissect with long and tedious havoc, fabled knights in battles famed. So it took him a long time to write this kind of heroic. So remember, this is heroic. How is it heroic? Adam and Eve are about to fall. Please me long choosing and beginning late. The first poem we read by Milton is about him feeling late and belated. Um, he's belated to himself. He always feels like he hasn't done enough, hasn't written enough, hasn't taught enough. And beginning late, not sedulous, not eager by nature to indict wars. I, I think Milton is saying, you know, I, I know there's a heroic poem in, in, in England. Um, and it's Christian. And, and that's uh, Spencer's Fairy Queen. And, but Milton's not going to write that kind of poem. Not sedulous by nature to indict wars, hitherto, hitherto the only argument heroic deem, chief mastery to dissect with long and tedious havoc. Fabled knights, we've moved on from the Greek to very English, right? In battle's fame. Uh, this is what Milton's poem does do, and this is how Milton is appropriating the genre of epic and making the sad story more, more heroic, the be better fortitude of patience and heroic martyrdom unsung. Or, now he's going back to what he's not going to do, or to describe races and games, or tilting furniture. That sounds like a Monty Python uh, a skit, right? Tilting furniture is, is, is uh, like jesting, right? Uh, tilting furniture in blazoned shields impresses quaint. Uh, shield, uh, you know. Look at those family symbols, heraldic symbols, comparisons and steeds, bases and tinsel trappings, gorgeous knights of jousting tournament. Then marshaled feasts served up in hall with sewers and seneschals, the skills of artifice or office meat. If you think I can't write a poem like Spencer, um, you're wrong. I can, but I'm choosing not to. The skill of artifice or office meat, not that which justly gives heroic name to person or to pump. All that stuff is great. It brings, um, it, it's, it's not, not chiefly a matter of art, but of divine inspiration, meaning these things are part of a, I'd just say these things are part of a different generic universe. Not that which justly gives heroic name to a person or to poem. I'm not writing that kind of poem. Me of these, nor skilled nor studious, higher, he says he's not skilled, nor studious, higher argument remains. Sufficient here, you see, is kind of going back to book one or book three, where, um, he describes, God says to um, Jesus, I made them su sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. Me of these not skilled nor studious, higher argument remains. I have a, I have a, a, a higher mandate, sufficient of itself to raise that name. Unless an age too late or cold climate or years damp, my intended wane depressed and much they may is all is if all be mine not hers who brings it lightly to my ear what, what's he afraid of here at the end me of these nor skilled nor studious hurry or argument remains sufficient of itself to raise that name what name i, I guess of heroism one more time Um, to person, me of these, not sk nor skilled nor studious, higher argument remains sufficient of itself to raise that name, that higher argument, I think, unless an age too late or a cold climate. Like another we talked about in book seven with the invocation that Milton has anxiety about the social world around him. Here's the physical world, unless an age too late or a cold climate. Um, English weather is supposed to make people feel melancholy. It's like living in Seattle, the sun never comes out, right? That name, unless an age too late or a cold climate or years damp, my intended wing, he's not going to be able to sort himself depressed. So much about what Milton is about is about the psyche. Um, I think in book nine, we'll see that Milton describes the psyche of Satan. Um, 
And here he's describing the psyche of the, the, the alienated, depressed poet. Or years damp my intended wing, depressed and much they may if all be mine, not hers who brings it nightly to my ear. The last couple of lines, I'm not really sure. And much they may have all be mine, not hers, who brings it nightly to my ear. The last two, the last two lines, again, emphasizing the way in which Milton is a, with the muse is a kind of conduit to him. But there's always that question. I mean, think about the difference between this and the, the Homeric stuff, right? Sing heavenly, sing heavenly muse. There's no, there, we don't have any psyche of the, of the poet. We have just do this for me and, 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 and through my affiliation to you, my readers will understand that on some level, this is a, in Homeric terms, a higher argument or inspired. And here in Paradise Lost, Milton spends such a long time trying to explain how he is, he is able to take on this task. And his relationship to the muse is here and in book seven, the one we've just looked at, it's never uncomplicated. Here there's the question whether or not he will hear her, whether it will come nightly to my ear, whether Milton will feel that traffic between the heavenly and the earthly. And I really think that's what Milton means by, um, by saying, um, I'm getting very distracted by the, the, the person who's sitting in the apartment next to me. Um, so I do want to emphasize one more thing, this idea of the relationship between Milton as a finite being who is relating to this higher argument that Milton, I think the chutzpah nuts is not so much that Milton feels that he's like a prophet, but the chutzpah is that Milton is understanding that his form of poetry is some kind of traffic with the divine. It is bringing, the poetry that Milton writes is a poetry that is adumbrating the transcendental. I just said that, I will now say it in English. It is through Milton's writing, there is a sense in which I am reaching to something higher, to something above the material, above the physical. How this form of inspiration is different from the Greek is a work for uh, me in 10 years if I get around to it, um, to think about the, the way in which these, how is poetic inspiration different? And, and more importantly, how is based on the differences in, in poetic inspiration, um, how is poetic representation and interpretation different? And I think, I think the, the Milton's way of understanding, it's not only Christian, it's Jewish, the idea of, because the very idea of idolatry is, or the very idea of, a, idolatry is a world in which there is no transcendental, right? The, what there is is what there is. What you see is what you get. And the Jewish world in it breaking the idols says there's another world of, of meaning. It's beyond what's here. Um, but who could say that Sophocles and Aeschylus and Homer aren't inspired? In any event, um, so Milton in these two invocations shows different aspects of the fragility of poetry. And I think most powerfully for us, at least most resonant for me is this idea that somehow, um, that was I guess uh, in, in, in the invocation to book seven, that the clamors in the world will, will drown out the sound of harp and voice.